<laughs> Are we live? Are you about to start? No. Welcome to Detroiters Speak. Um, I'm Carolyn Baker. Um, and this series is Making Labor Work. And today's moderator is Craig Register, and I will pass it to Craig. Good evening, everybody. I am happy to be here with you. Welcome to Detroiters Speak, as Carolyn said. And this is the second session in our series that will go until early April. And one of the really exciting things about this series is that we're actually going to be gathering in person soon uh, in March. And so this is a, a collaboration that has gone on for many years with some important partners. So I just want to um, briefly talk about who puts the series together, and then we're going to move into tonight's focus. So this is a community classroom collaboration. So joining us tonight, we have 69 students from the University of Michigan, from Wayne State University, uh, and others joining us on the Zoom. And then we have another group of folks on our YouTube live stream. So welcome to both groups of students. Um, we take a philosophy that we're lifelong learners in Detroit or Speak. So regardless of whether you're enrolled in a college or out in the world doing your work, um, after long since past being in school, we consider you a student and we are happy to have you here. This is a collaboration between the General Baker Institute in Detroit, the Department of Af African American Studies at Wayne State University and the U of M Semester in Detroit program. And there's some other sponsors I need to mention who kind of help pay for what we do. The Michigan Mellon Project on the Egalitarian Metropolis, the U of M Detroit Center, who will help pay for some of the food that we'll be eating together in March, and uh, the Wayne State University AAUP chapter local 6075 of the American Federation of Teachers. As Carolyn said, my name is Craig Register, and I'm the acting director of a program called Semester in Detroit at U of M, as well as a lecturer on the Ann Arbor campus <clears throat> at University of Michigan. And I'm also a proud member as a lecturer of my own union, LEO, the Lecture Employees Organization, Local 6244 of the American Federation of Teachers. Tonight's session is entitled Making Labor Work, which you may notice is also the first phrase in the overall series title. So to kind of help frame what we're going to do tonight, I think we should take a, a few minutes to, uh, to think about the title Making Labor Work. And so I'm going to share with you some of the ideas that come to mind for me in the title. First, when we say labor, generally we're, we're using shorthand, of course, to refer to the labor movement, which is a dynamic and by no means monolithic social force that is both evolved and devolved, you could say, throughout history. And as General Baker reminded us in the video we watched last week, if you, if you had joined us last week, while organized unions are essential to the labor movement, we need to be always thinking much more expansively and that labor includes anyone and everyone who works in order to survive in our society. Those who are employed formally and informally, the underemployed, the unemployed, those unable to work, and many others. The second thing I wanted to say um, about the title is that by suggesting that we need to make labor work, that is the multidimensional, multifaceted labor movement, we're clearly also pointing to the reality and the lived experience by many that it hasn't been working or at least not as well as we think it could or should. And there's much we can point to about the labor movement historically and even today and how it hasn't really been working for everyday people. General Baker's life and legacy once again brings light to the many historic struggles to make labor work. He spent much of his life fighting hard to change his own union, right, the UAW. He fought endemic racism and sexism within his union. He fought against what some call bureaucratic or business unionism. And he fought for his union and all unions for that matter to do more for the communities where workers lived. Finally, the word making in the title make labor work, it suggests that in order to change the labor movement for the better, to make it more powerful so that it can fight better for the interests of everyday people, this will require force effort and action. We need to make labor work. In other words, we, the big we, that is everyone who is forced to sell their labor in order to survive in this world, and it's not just the United States, it's this world, needs to be involved. We need to make labor work. Tonight's speakers, we hope and I believe, I'm confident, 
are going to help all of us think more about how we can all become better and stronger actors in this important movement work. And it's also gonna really help lay the foundation for the whole series, because starting next week, we talk about the UAW, we move into service work, we move into logistics, public sector, and more. So much of what we talk about tonight will help lay the groundwork. So I hope those are helpful kind of preliminary framing remarks. Let me introduce our format for the evening. We're gonna mix it up a little bit. We're gonna start, this is an experiment, but I think it'll work. We're gonna start with a little kind of more short form format. So I have a couple questions I'm gonna throw at our panelists who I'm gonna introduce in a second. And each of them will take two or three minutes to respond to that question, maybe have some conversation amongst themselves, which would be awesome. After those two questions of kind of short form, we're gonna give each of our speakers a little more time to kind of dig deeper and share with us the work that they're doing today and work they've done in the past. Um, so we'll kind of try both. And then after that, I hope by 8.15 and no later, um, we're gonna have some robust discussion. So without further ado, and if Carolyn's ready to pop people up, I'm gonna introduce our panel. We have three remarkable people that are gonna, um, I think be quite interesting to listen to. And the first is Todd Wolfson. Todd is an associate professor in the Department of Journalism and Media Studies at Rutgers University. He's trained as an anthropologist. Todd's research focuses on the convergence of technology, inequality, and social change. Todd has written and or co-edited three books, which is three more than me, uh, Digital Rebellion, The Birth of the Cyber Left, The Great Refusal, Herbert Mark Hughes, and Contemporary Social Movements, and the gig economy, workers in the media in the age of convergence. Todd is also the co-founder of Movement Alliance Project and 215 or 215 People's Alliance. Both organizations are devoted to building power in Philadelphia at the intersection of race, technology, and inequality. Todd is currently the vice president of the Rutgers AAUP AFT chapter and the immediate past president as well. And the Rutgers AAUP AFT chapter represents 8,000 faculty grad workers, postdocs, and counselors at Rutgers University. Finally, Todd is the co-director of the Media Inequality and Change Center, a partnership between University of Pennsylvania and Rutgers University. So welcome, Todd, and thank you for being here tonight. The second person I'd like to introduce is Margaret Prescott. Margaret is a decades-long community-based women's rights, anti-poverty, and anti-racist campaigner. Her work is local, national, and international, and includes welfare rights, a care income living wage for all workers, I'm sorry, including mothers and other unpaid caregivers, child tax credits, a permanent child benefit, support for grassroots campaigners for justice in Haiti. She is also the host of Sojourner Truth, a nationally syndicated drive time public affairs program on Pacifica Radio. She is a member of the SAG I think we say AFTRA or AFTRA union. She's a co-founder of Black Women for Wages for Housework, a founding member of Women of Color Global Women's Strike, and a founder of the Every Mother is a Working Mother Network, and the Black Coalition Fighting Back Serial Murders. She led the lobbying of the International Women Count Network that won the 1995 UN resolution to measure and value unwaged work in the home, on the land, and in the community. She worked with welfare rights greats, Beulah Sanders and Johnny Tillman, joining them as delegates to the first congressionally mandated conference on women held in Houston, Texas in 1977, where they won a resolution that called for welfare to be called a wage. She's also on the board of the National Welfare Rights Union. Margaret, we appreciate having you with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lastly, I'm gonna introduce my former neighbor, but current friend, Peter Landon. I used to live in Southwest Detroit where Peter resides. Peter is a lifelong socialist who has been doing workplace organizing since 1979. He was a truck driver in the Detroit metro area from 1992 to 2004. He was an active union member in the Teamsters and an organizer for the caucus Teamsters for a Democratic Union or TDU as many say, from 1992 to 2022. He recently retired about a month ago, but is still knee deep in the labor work of the Democratic Socialists of America, or DSA, both locally and nationally. And it's important 
to note that reading about General Baker and the League of Revolutionary Black Workers was an inspiration to Peter as a student radical in the late 70s. And it's a big part of what got him to Detroit decades ago. Welcome, Peter. Thank you for being here. And it's great to see all three of you on the screen with me. Thank you, Carolyn. So enough of me blabbing, although I really like talking about our speakers, because as you've already heard, there's a tremendous amount of experience on your screen. But let's get the conversation going. And so I posed two very pretty simple questions in some ways, but I think actually pretty big questions. And they're really kind of foundational. And I think if it's okay, we'll start with Todd and then go Margaret and then go Peter. And the first question is, that, is about unions and unions in their most expansive sense. And so each of you has extensive experience with unions. I just read your introductions and with organizations who have been fighting for the rights of all sorts of workers, whether they're in unions or not. So let's starting with Todd, you know, from your perspective in a maybe just two minutes or three minutes, in its most sort of ideal sense, in its most aspirational sense, you know, what does a union mean to you? Thank you, Craig. Um, first, I have to say thank you so much for everyone that put this together. And thank you, Craig, David, and Carol. And, and also, it's just amazing to be on a panel with two amazing organizers, Margaret and Peter. And I have to make a quick kid caveat that kids could come and attack in any moment. But the other thing I wanted to say, and, and this goes to the last point about Peter before I just answer this question, is what an honor it is for me to get an opportunity to speak at the General Baker Institute. Um, General Baker is my absolute hero. Um, I've been, as, as you were saying, I've done a lot of organizing in Philly, community-based organizing. And in that work, we've connected deeply with Detroit and had a lot of give and take. And over that time, I've had a bunch of opportunities to come up to Detroit and hear from Marion and Jen uh, about their work and their vision. And those experiences, and, and hearing General Baker talk about the history and the broader work in Detroit from DRUM to the League to the Welfare Rights Organization and, and Marion as well, I would say is like the single most important influence in my life. So I just, I have to say that I, I wanted to name my first kid general. There was a big fight with my wife. Uh, she wasn't down for that. So it was too militaristic, but anyway, I, I had to say that. So, um, so to the question, you know, so I'm currently a vice president of a union and, you know, um, and I, to me, I think the answer to this feels pretty straightforward. Um, for me, the union is the power of collectivity, right? long and the short of it. Um, certainly there are moments when a union feels like it's about a collective bargaining agreement or it's about particular worker action at a work site. And that is sometimes a momentary kind of expression of what unionism is, on um, what a union is. But for me, at the heart of it, it is people coming together to change their political and economic and social circumstances. So ultimately for me, a union is about power but not about individual power. It's only, it's about collective power. So, I mean, there's more to say, but I really wanted to, I just want to keep it simple and straight. And that's what, what I think a union is. Thank you, Todd. And go ahead. We'll let Margaret go. And then Peter, you can just jump right in from there after Margaret's um, uh, answered the question. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Todd. And in part, I, I do what you teach, right? Because <laughs> I've been up since 2.30 this morning because I had to do go live at seven o'clock for my uh, West Coast time for my national broadcast. So I'm a little peaky at this particular moment. Um, I want to talk about unions in the aspirational sense, if that would be, would be okay, because as a person who's been grounded and trained in the welfare rights movement, in the women's movement, anti-racist movement, um, there's always be that kind of um, community, organized labor unions in the traditional uh, sense. Uh, on the one hand, one needing the other, and it's usually been more labor unions, organized labor for strikes and other things needing support from the community. And then those of us in the community feeling that when we need support around welfare reform or particular, uh, particular community-based issues that necessarily organized labor hasn't been there. So although I'm a member of, of unions, the, the, I thought it was a stroke of brilliance for Marion Kramer and, and others to name the National Welfare Rights Union. It, prior to that, it was the National Welfare Rights Organization. And I think that was really giving some leadership and direction 
that I think organized labor and labor unions have to go because the coming together of labor um, in the traditional sense and community-based organizations, I really think is the direction that we have to go in if we're going to continue to build the labor movement. So on the one hand, I've Hello. worked very closely with labor unions, local 132, uh, the gas company workers winning the largest pay equity um, fight in private um, industry in the United States. That victory happened because it was a labor union community collaboration. So I, ju I just, you know, there's a lot more I could say about that. Also, the Longshore um, Workers Union, um, very, you know, very much uh, supportive of their work as well. So I, I want to talk a bit more about that maybe in the more extensive uh, conversations because I think we actually have to redefine what we mean by labor unions and unions generally. Thanks to Margaret and Todd for very insightful comments. Certainly I'm in the spirit of those, those comments. I came from a picket line today of some baristas in downtown Detroit that are trying to organize. And uh, there's 15 of them at this particular shop, Great Lakes Coffee. And they were, I think what they're looking for is dignity and respect in the workplace. They uh, started to organize because of issues around COVID. They are finding their voice and their sense of their own power. And I think that's what unions ideally can be about is individuals finding their collective consciousness and power in a workplace or in another setting. I would, based on my experience, um, throw in a curveball, which is uh, unions as an institution or an organization are inherently defensive or reactive um, given the construct that we live under capitalism. And so that there's limitations to what, uh, or we come up against limitations of our own voice and collective power in unions as an institution. And I think that sort of necessitates a, a broader analysis and perspective and vision of politics. and what's involved beyond unions. And I think Margaret sort of was teasing us in a way, rightfully so, that you know, if, if unions are really gonna rise to the moment, uh, you know, they have to be, well, I don't know if they have to become something more, we have to become something more, we in the, in the big sense, and we need more than you know, workplace organization if we're gonna make the kind of lives that we need. But I believe it's a really important vehicle and institution for people learning and stretching their capacities for what they're capable of. So let's take a few minutes on the same topic and let you each kind of respond to each other a little bit. And I, I'll step back, but what are you hearing that you want to respond to from any of you? And I'll let you all jump in on your own. Well, look, if nobody will jump in, I will, uh, picking up on, on the last the last comment. Uh, you know, I, I agree generally with Todd's point, clearly union, unity. I mean, growing up, I'm an immigrant from a small island in the Caribbean. My mother was a member of the Mother's Union. Interestingly, that they use that term. You know, in my village, it was connected uh, to the church. Um, people in, in uh, that kind of third world village poverty type, um, society, you have to, in a lot of ways, work much more collectively just in order to, to survive. So the idea of just coming coming together to build uh, power generally is, is also aspirational. And I suppose uh, my critique is, is that um, organized labor has always been dependent on, on the community. I can't think from the minor strikes in, in the UK uh, to Wildcat and other strikes that have happened here, at least from what I know of, uh, of, of labor history, it's always been a lot of them women, but not only women in the community that are kind of holding things together when there's no pace check coming in, uh, manning the, 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 the soup kitchens, et cetera. So there's always been that kind of collaboration, but it hasn't really been acknowledged as part of 
organized labor as part of the labor union in any official sense. It's kind of hidden work. It's almost like the housework, you know, of, uh, you know, of labor. And I was so excited when Local 132 in Southern California started for their union meetings, they mandated and started organizing childcare. Um, so, and us, you know, we helped to organize the child care. We were very happy, happy to do it, but they recognize that for a lot of the women union members, the customer service reps, et cetera, they had kids, evening meetings, you know what I mean? What, what, what are you supposed to do? So it was recognizing that double day, the double shift that a lot of women uh, in the work, wage workforce are doing. I could say a bit more about that, but I'll, I'll just stop there that I think we, I really want to push the envelope a little bit in terms of how we see organized labor and labor union organizing generally, and why I think the National Welfare Rights Union is such a great example of that. So I'm not surprised it came out of that whole history with General Baker and, and Marion Kramer and, and the rest of that crew in Detroit. Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in, Peter, if, if that is cool. Yeah, I, I completely, um join with you, Mark. I mean, so I'm in, in a moment for the last five, four or five years, I've been in the leadership of a union, uh, you know, and that's been a really interesting experience for the previous like 15 to 20 years of my organizing experience. I've been coming from the community side with a vision of how do we build in Philadelphia in particular, how do we build community labor alliances and what do they look like and how do you create them in an organic, real, meaningful way where, and there's just such a power imbalance. And, and I don't know if that's been your experience, Margaret, but from my experience, there's been such a power imbalance between community organizing in relationship to labor unions, which have budgets and staffs and at a whole different level. And like, and so they come to you and they're like, yeah, hey, we need help X, Y, and Z. We have a contract campaign. Could you come out outside the hotel and march with us? Um, but they, it's rare, it's really rare when unions, when the script is flipped and unions are part of and connected to the opposite side of the struggle. And that's something we need to correct. And so an example, just brief, and, I, and hopefully, uh, you know, I'll shut up, but just is Chicago Teachers Union is clearly a good example of a union that's trying to flip the script here, right? With their last couple of contracts, they've centered community oriented demands, particularly around their students, whether it's the teachers, the size of classrooms or more mental health counselors or housing counselors, because so many students are housing insecure in Chicago in the Chicago public school district. So they made demands that use the contract to center community fights and, and then therefore built out with community. And I think that's one inspiring model of many. So, but I just want to join with you. I completely agree. Well, I may be throwing another curveball, but uh, I think the union establishment as I've known it in its various flavors over 40 years has been far more open to struggles outside of the workplace and solidarizing with struggles outside the workplace than it has been doing what I see as its fundamental work, which is at the point of production. Now, maybe I'm overly reducing it in terms of the point of production, and I don't want to be sort of painted into that corner, but I feel like we've, we as a union movement, for all intents and purposes, in many instances, now again, I'm overstating it, but we've given up the fight with the company in the workplace over working conditions, et cetera, because we've made the trade off of wages and benefits. Now, when the economy was booming up until 1973 or so, capital could give us all sorts of, throw us all sorts of bones in terms of wages, benefits, et cetera, at least some of us, wages, benefits. And, but once the economy started turning, the union establishment had no politics to sort of confront what I believe is an us versus them perspective. And basically we've just seen the steady erosion in my working lifetime of sort of the standard issue, you know, union benefits, wages, et cetera. And uh, the establishment hasn't been up for a fight over how we have our collective voice or capacity or sense of unionism in, in the workplace. So that most folks in unions, and now it's, you know, around 7% of the private sector, for all intents and purposes, they see being in the union as sort of their last defense if they get fired or some other issue and it's there to sort of maybe protect them or it's a tax on their paycheck in terms of paying their dues. But there's no sense of 
the union is helping me have a better working life. Now, again, I'm probably overstating it. And most folks in unions would say better to be in a union than not in a union based on what I know about my niece or my uncle or whatever that's in a non-union setting. But there's not a, a, what I would call a us versus them or a class perspective when it comes to how we have confronted the workplace over the last 40 years, if not longer. One of the things that was inspiring to me about drum in general was they really did. They start, you know, they, yes, they had roots in the community and they were doing the South End as a newspaper and all sorts of other things, but they understood their role at work and they understood how they were getting screwed by the union establishment and they stood up for themselves and, and articulated a set of politics and a perspective around that. And uh, they were Marxists for whatever, I, I don't know if Carolyn if in his later days, if he would have considered himself a Marxist, General Baker or David Goldberg might be able to speak to it, but they had a class analysis. Uh, and I think we've lost that in, in the American established trade union movement. Sure. This is a great back and forth, and we're going to keep doing this, but I want to give, um, let's give Margaret and Todd just maybe a minute each to any other responses on this question. I'd like to ask my second question before, which we've already started to touch on, but before we move into kind of longer remarks from each of you where you can build on these points. Margaret and Todd, any other thoughts and just in response to what Peter was just saying you wanted to add? Yeah, well, I want to push back on Peter's, um, you know, um, point of production because there's a term I use called the fetish of the point of the production. Because when people go on about the point of production, they don't or seem to forget about most of the workers in the world who are unwaged, okay? If you look at the global South, if you look at what is happening in, in our communities, if you look at people who are not now in wage work and with a total focus on the point of production, you're forgetting about most of us. And we also happen to be producing trillions of dollars for capital and capitalism that totally remains hidden. And then they lie and tell us, if you want welfare, if you want childcare, you want help with elderly dependents, you gotta get out there and get a job. You gotta become a productive worker, okay? I don't know anyone who isn't a productive worker and I don't know any job that's harder than raising the next generation. So I get very, you know, a, a little, um, I should say antsy about this point of production business. And also I'm a member of SAG-AFTRA. I've worked with labor unions. The labor unions that I have been involved in have totally have focused entirely on benefits, on wage issues, on workplace uh, issues. Now, there are a lot of sellouts at the top. There's a lot of corruption in labor union leadership. I think we have to make a distinction with that and rank and file people or shop stewards or whatever that are really trying to do their best to get the best contract or whatever. So I think it's a much bigger discussion when it comes to the point of production. But I could tell you, a lot of us women, a lot of us caregivers are royally pissed off. And we're saying that what is work and what is a worker has to be redefined. We refuse to be left out anymore. We refuse to be seen as not productive if we're not a slave to some capitalists and, and a factory floor or some other place. Thank you, Margaret. Todd, you're gonna to get the last words in on this question and then each of you will elaborate further, of course, in your own remarks. Well, I, I'll just say two quick things. One, you know, of course, we have to expand this definition. And I, I really, wages for housework is, is an example of that. And that's like, we need a big united front. We also need to know where we have the most leverage. And we, those are questions we have to think through as we're organizing. Um, the other th point I just want to make is I agree. One, I completely agree that there's far too many corrupt labor leaders and that's a real problem. And But it's a structural problem. It's not a problem of personality and we should recognize it as such. But then the other point I think with, that's really important here from my, what I hear Peter saying, and maybe I hear, I feel a little differently is where I think labor unions have really fallen down. And we can talk about this to the next question more, but is their inability to actually build strong fighting organization. That's the failure. That's where the failure lies. It's a lack of, and, and TDU is a, is a great kind of counterexample, but a lack of democracy, a lack of militant engaged political education and leadership development, which leads to strong unions that can take on strong militant campaigns at the workplace and then build coalitions that can change beyond the workplace. That's where labor has failed 
I think, in its most epic proportions, entailing the Democratic Party and all that crap. Um, and so, uh, and I think that's sort of where you were going, Peter, but maybe it's just a different flavor of the same argument. Thank you, Todd. This is great, by the way, because if we were all singing the exact same song, uh, I don't know how much we'd be learning. So I think these, you know, these are sort of tension to growth in many ways for all of us. So I appreciate this. Um, we've already, you've already started talking about the labor movement and you've already kind of answered this question, but I kind of maybe just in a, in a bit of a shorter um, response, maybe a more direct one before we move into your remarks. How excited should we be today? about the labor movement, however broadly you want to define it. I mean, some would say in the popular media, right, that unions and interest in unions is in surveys, Gallup surveys, is higher than it's been in a really long time. And so Striketober happened last fall. I mean, it would seem that in the common sort of parlance and in the mainstream media, that more people are paying attention, many of the people in this Zoom room, perhaps. And so should we be excited about this? How excited? Um, give us your sort of brief assessment, and then you'll have time to elaborate further in your remarks. And Margaret, you want to start on that one? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of exciting things that are happening. I mean, you temper that with the fact when you see the drop of the, the in membership of labor unions, but I'm really excited. Um, you know, the, the spate of teacher strikes, remember that, that happened, you know, a couple of years ago. And uh, I, I have to say, I'm not surprised that it was teachers who went out on strike, did the wildcat strikes, but also made sure that the students had food to eat. They organized, you know, those luncheons and all of that was the kind of, and, and if you think about it, teaching is kind of an extension of caregiving and taking care of these kids. So you think about the fact that a lot of kids are going to be hungry if school isn't open because maybe that's the one place they're going to get a meal. So I've been really excited by what the teachers um, in Chicago, but in, in even some of the red states are uh, doing the teachers strike here in, um, in uh, California as well. And the, the low-waged um, workers now that are organizing me, the Amazon workers, the, the Fight for 15, I think all of that is really great. And having much more of that uh, union uh, community uh, collaboration, because I do think that is the direction to go in. And that's a big, huge strength, I think, for organized labor. So I'm, I'm excited and I'm hopeful. And I'm especially excited by those who say, you know what, if the leadership says, don't go out on strike. And, you know, all my mates are telling me, hey, this is what we got to do. We're going to do it anyway. So, you know, take action into your own hands and, and have some autonomy and, and stand up for your rights and, and find a voice. So I think that's, that's to me, that's, that's really exciting. And it's also exciting when the longshoremen shut down the ports, right? <laughs> when, when they do that for, you know, Black Lives Matter, or when they did it, you know, to end apartheid in South Africa, I really think they provide a lot of leadership um, in, in, in the labor union movement as well. Can I follow the first this time, Todd? Are you okay with that? Um, first, Margaret, you're Absolutely right. I also believe in the point of reproduction, not just producing babies, but all the work that is done outside of the workplace. And I see it as an inherent, you know, philosophical, not just philosophical, practical observation and reality that if, you know, uh, there's a whole half the world holding up the sky, if not more than half the world holding up the sky of our sustenance, right? And, and if there wasn't that sustenance, there would be no uh, profit being made, right? So I, I definitely solarize with you around that perspective, though I will still say that not enough attention has been paid to <laughs> the workplace. And along with Todd said, sort of unions are not, not fighting organizations. And so that's what I've spent my life trying to, to do is my contribution to our, our struggles, right? In terms of, um, in terms of, well, Craig knows I'm on, I'm a total pessimist, though always, though always hopeful, always hopeful and engaged, right, Craig? So um, I see the current moment, you know, 2022 is sort of 14 or 15 years removed from the Great Recession. And I think the Great Recession has really had an impact on the generation that's grown up, come up since then. And I think things like uh, Black Lives Matter, Occupy, the Wisconsin Rebellion, people have referenced the, the teachers organizing, all that has been in the mix, the Bernie candidacy, all that's been in the mix sort of over the last 15 years or so in terms of getting to this moment. And I think 
you know, this generation, you know, folks that are between, let's say, 15 and 35, um, you know, it, they face, I don't know about a, a different reality, but, you know, um, capitalism isn't working for us. You know, you look at climate change or the, the threat of climate, you know, extinction, all of this. Now we have the crisis of COVID, right? I think we're going to be in more and more perpetual crisis of one kind or another, not that we haven't been in lots of crises over the last 50, 100, 200 years, but I think the pace of crisis is gonna continue and people really need to figure out ways of stepping up to make their lives differently. And is this, you know, are the ways we're making our lives, you know, we talk about making labor work, are the way we're making our lives in 2022, what we really need, I think, unions or workers or broadly defined workers need to figure out what they want to work on and what's working for us and what we need. And, uh, you know, that's the $64,000 question and it's not easily resolvable. But if we, the majority, both nationally and internationally, don't figure out ways of, of uh, reorienting our lives, you know, we're, we're, it's barbarism. Yeah. Um, I mean, I agree with, with the points that I've made. I, I think, one, it's important because there's a lot of students here that just flagged the fact that union has labor, the labor movement has been in a long decline, right? I think we all know it, but it's important to just flag it and mark it, right? A long decline. And um, that decline, and, and it's not just a decline that came out of nowhere. There was a concerted attack on labor, right? A concerted attack on labor and labor unions and their social movements coming out of the 60s, et cetera. And it's important that, that labor in being, uh, being under attack, um, unfortunately, the leadership of most of the labor unions have moved into a very conservative stance, right? And so there's a give and take here we, we should know and, and be clear about. And, and this has led to very, and, and Peter said this earlier, but I wanna underline it, very defensive struggles. And the leaders of most of our unions at the national level and in our locals have drawn smaller and smaller and more defensive struggles, right? And the boundaries and the way they're thinking about what's in front of them has been, you know, really problematic and nowhere near the kind of militant unionism that drum represents, right? And that UA, the UAW local then that was reformed by the leaders of drum and the league, et cetera. So, but on the other hand, and, and folks remarking this, we have been in a cycle of, of resistance of some sort. Uh, you know, we could we try to figure out what it connects to, but we could at least say post the Great Recession that there has been growing movement really, uh, engagement um, and that, you know, everything from, you know, the uprisings in the Middle East and North Africa to indignados to Occupy Yes to then the two amazing waves of struggle around Black Lives Matter um, and the umbrella movement, we've seen it across the globe, right? And I think with the pandemic and like the kind of social, interpersonal and economic harm it's wrought and our inability to respond to it has wrought, we're now seeing this new sort of moment of worker militancy in relationship to this other broader struggle. That's how I'm reading it. And I'm excited about it. Um, I think um, it, it's it's something to be hopeful about, and but only if we dream big in this moment. And this goes to Margaret's initial points. Uh, I think we have to change our agendas. We need big agendas. Our unions, and from the national to the local level, must be connecting to social movements. They must be connecting to community organizations, and not only fighting to transform the workplace, but fighting to transform the world right? With the working class in the lead, however you want to define that. And I, I, I think we're in a moment where it's not just going to happen. We have to collectively push labor towards that in our own roles, whether we're community organizers or labor leaders or la members of labor unions or students. We need to push for bigger vision and force our unions to, to organize and be militant and to connect and build and collaborate. So I, you know, I, I don't want to say, I think it's the end all be all moment, but I am hopeful. Thank you, Todd. Well, this is, this has been great. This has been an awesome start to our discussion. And I want to, we're going to turn now to the so-called long format where each of you will get 10 minutes really to kind of bring us more deeply into your current 
organizing work. Each of you have been organizers for very long times, activists for very long times with many, many different campaigns and experiences. I, and it doesn't matter to me who goes first. So whoever wants to go first can just jump right in. But each of you will have 10 minutes to, as I said, to, to bring us into your daily organizing life. Tell us what inspires you about your organizing, what keeps you up at worrying at night as well. And, you know, and share with us some of the lessons, highlights, and challenges of your activist organizing work today. And each of you is involved in so many things. So you, get, you got to pick. So I don't know what you're going to bring to us, but I look forward to hearing it. And as I said, once we get to eight minutes with each of you, I'm going to rudely, although not so rudely, interrupt you because you already gave me my permission to do that and say you have two minutes left. I mean, students, whether you're on YouTube or whether you're on the chat right now, continue to think about your questions. And we're gonna give folks an opportunity to ask questions themselves or to just put them in the chat after we hear from each of our panelists um, and bringing us more deeply into your work. So who would like to start? And I will keep time. <laughs> Do I need to pick? Likely. Margaret, you're the only one who's unmuted. Do you wanna go? I should have put that mute button on while I hear what others had to say. Okay, um, I'll, I'll just say that um, uh, one quick question point on the previous discussion. Part of the work I do is international. And when it comes to labor unions, one concern we have is some very conservative positions that, for example, the AFL-CIO takes when it comes to international issues, um, funding on NED when it, it has to do with uh, Venezuela and, you know, other you know, other places that are really trying to get out from under. I just wanted to highlight that a bit because we have to keep an eye on the international stuff as well, because I think that's also part of the problem that those of us who live in the belly of the beast here in the U.S., that we're too stuck on the U.S. and we're not really seeing the interrelationship to all of it and what we do and how it impacts people in other countries. So I, I just wanted to um, to say that in terms of the organizing uh, that I've been doing, I suppose a lot of my adult life, um, my life's work in a way has been on that issue of pushing that issue about the point of production and the redefinition of work and who is a worker and to get the work um, that's done um, on the land, by the way, in the community, as well as in the home, measured and valued and actually paid for. Because, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't claim to know a lot about Marx, but I do know that he, he talked about the exploitation of the worker, the exploitation of the soil. So we're also very much looking now at the work of caring for the environment and, and caring uh, for the land. But the, the, when it comes to the whole caregiving business and the capitalist lie behind all of this, we produce all the workers in the world and we also reproduce them. And then we're told you're not doing anything, right? You got to go work at McDonald's in order to be a productive person. It's like, what? Are you kidding me? So um, beginning with early, uh, well, very, very early training in my village, um, in Barbados, which is where I'm from, and watching how hard people work there, a lot of it on wage and a lot of the wealth being sucked out of our island. We were a British uh, colony, the only place in the world ruled by England for over 300 years without ever changing hands, and the only place in the world that has the distinction of an entirely slave society. The entire society of Barbados was based on slavery. There was nothing else, okay? Um, and meaning it was very, very brutal. And so the slavers from Barbados were imported to train people along the Carolinas coast and that produced so much wealth that Harvard and William and Mary Brown, a lot of those really built and grew from money coming um, uh, from a, a British colony like Barbados. But I'm mentioning that because when I ran into the welfare rights movement that trained me that I was um, out of university and part of the community control of schools, uh, community control of schools struggling, Ocean Hill, Brownsville and Brooklyn, those mothers on welfare were the ones 
leading that struggle. They, they were the ones there because they were in the community. They weren't at the factory. They weren't in um, a maid uh, sleeping out. So they were able to come down to our school to PS 155, make that strike work and help to mold uh, people like me and really have a very different view about who welfare mothers were. Quite as it's kept, they were also critical to the struggle to win open admissions in the City University of New York. And it was a women's movement. It was a black led, brown led in New York, Puerto Rican women, but uh, you know, uh, other parts of the country, um, other, other um, uh, folks as well. So that really was, a, a, in a lot of ways, my village was a touchstone, but that was also a touchstone for me. And I was really, honored then to be able to, to work with uh, Beulah Sanders and also to read that Johnny Tillman, a black woman out of Watts, okay? A mother of a whole set of children back in 1965, she said, you know, the, the president could solve the welfare problem right now. All he has to do is to pay, pay women a living wage. She used the term living, dig that, a living wage for the work that they're doing, taking care of their children. And she was fusion. She wasn't a separatist. She said, if we did that housewives, I know she meant them white housewives, they would benefit as well, okay? So I, I think that a lot of um, direction comes from the most impoverished women at the bottom, but they're not viewed as providing leadership. They're not viewed even as being a women's movement. Cause I could tell you, we were also up against the main, what we call the mainstream women's movement, and their solution was get a job outside the home. And as the black women, we would say, wait a minute, we've been doing that, I don't want to cuss, since slave days, and we ain't free yet. What the hell makes you think that that's the road to freedom? You know, it's going to be further exploited by some capitalists. So that has been a, a constant tug of war and an uphill struggle that those of you who have been working on valuing um, unwage work and redefining the worker, we've been up against that again and again and again and again. They want to say, okay, we'll give you a little childcare, but we're not going to give you any money for the caregiving work that you do. You, you know, oh, oh, they find every way to push us outside the home um, with the lie that that is really where you're productive, but follow the money look at the value, you know, insurance companies sell insurance on the basis of if we die. If your wife dies, somebody on, on this call said they have some kids, was it you? You know, <laughs> you know, if the caregiver died, this is what it's gonna cost you to replay her services. So it means that you're worth something dead, but not alive. So I've been um, very much um, on this which is one of the reasons I founded Black Women for Wages for Housework, came together with the National um, Welfare Rights Organization now with the National Welfare Rights Union. Um, Malcolm X said, take it to the UN. So as women, we listened to Malcolm and we went into the UN. And during the UN Women's Decade, we fought tooth and nail for 10 bloody long, hard fought years to get a resolution to redefine to measure and value unwage work, not only in the home, but the agricultural work on the land. If you look at Africa and Latin America, who's doing most of, most of that work, okay? It took us 10 years, but we finally won. A, a, a long story, can't tell it can't tell it now, but it was grassroots women who led that fight. So if anybody tells you any different, don't you believe that? Fast forward to today, we have, are fighting tooth and nail to hang on to the child tax credit. The United States is the only rich country in the world that doesn't offer some kind of child benefit or family allowance. Now I'm not saying that's the revolution, but what I am saying is that it puts some money in the hands of mothers who could put some food on the table, who don't have to skip meals so that their kids could eat. And now you got people in, in mansion from West Virginia, all them hungry children over in West Virginia saying it should be taken away. This is a campaign that we're working on, very hard on right now. I sent some documents that the students could take a look at. But when it comes to students, I wanna mention another thing. Congresswoman Gwen Moore, black woman out of Wisconsin, she was on welfare, when she was on welfare, she had to fight to keep her two kids from um, child welfare. That's another issue. We find that, that we're working on right now that increasingly children, especially black and brown, what they call BPOC, but also a lot of 
told white kids of being taken from their families and put in foster care, put up for adoption, not because of abuse, but because the families are poor. So that if your water is cut off in Detroit, you know, if you're living in a damn tent down in, in, in um, downtown Los Angeles, instead of them giving you the resources to get some water, put some food at the table, get some housing, they're gonna take your child. And you know how traumatic that is for a child? Two minutes. Two minute warning. Let me tell you about Gwen Moore then. So she now is in Congress and she went to Congress to try to undo what Clinton's welfare reform did. Okay, I don't have to tell students if you all don't know about it, please ask your professors, find out about it. She now has um, legislation called the Worker Relief and Credit Reform Act, in which she says, treating caregiving as work, expand the types of activities that constitute work to include family caregiving, right? Children and elderly dependents, treating higher education as work. All you students sitting out there, y'all know that it's work being a student, right? You are trained to go in and provide source, you know, work and resources for somebody else. So, you know, she also has that treating higher education as work would also treat education activities as work. So that means if you're on TAN, if you're a mother on welfare or whatever, and they said, oh, you're mandated to work, okay? Being a caregiver, being a student, those are two things. I'm not saying this is the revolution, but I'm saying that it is a step along the way of us reclaiming all the damn wealth that they've stolen from us and the lie that they tell us that we're unproductive if we're not at the point of production. My two minutes must be up. Wow, you are good. You got 20 seconds left. Any final thoughts? <laughs> Boy, do I have some final thoughts. Yeah, I do actually, because we're also part, you know, the work I do is local, national, and international. And right now there's an international campaign called the Care Income Now uh, campaign. And we are saying that people who are caring not only for people, but caring for the land, the environmentalists, people who are doing soil regeneration, you know, the planet is in trouble in case you didn't notice that, um, you know, that there should be a care income for these people. So when you tell the fishermen in Maine, you can't lobster fish in this way because the right whale is going to be extinct. They got to feed a family. They need some mm -hmm. money so that they could not fish in a certain way or that they could afford to fish in a way that's more sustainable to their families as well as to the right whale. That's an example of a care income in a practical way for caring for the environment. Thank you so much, Margaret. Thank you so okay. much. Yeah. Let's turn it over to Peter and then we're going to, we're going to end with Todd. Um, and thank you so much, Margaret. Um, you covered a lot in a very short amount of time and I really appreciate that. So let's <laughs> hand things over to, to Peter Landon. Well, the, during COVID these last two years, the notion of essential work has come up and in a nod to Margaret, what's more essential than caregiving, right? In all sorts of ways. Todd, I guess, has some children at least that might interrupt. So that means that he's had to worry about uh, what to do with his children during COVID. And it seems to me caregiving is essential and we should find ways of uh, challenging the system on its notions. You know, I mean, they, they wanted us to, to move the system, not just caregivers, but, you know, Amazon employees, et cetera, to keep, keep things going, right? But uh, are they, are, you know, Jeff Bezos and everybody else, you know, made a killing on COVID, whereas the rest of us were killed or many of us were killed by COVID that were considered essential, right? So um, I've worked as a Teamster, as a truck driver for the last 40 years. I retired a couple months ago. Um, I haven't driven a truck in about 20 years because I was organizing in the caucus in my union, Teamsters for a Democratic Union in the Teamsters. But our... Our approach uh, or you know, my work in terms of work uh, has been oriented towards uh, organization. Uh, the unions weren't, when I came into the workforce in uh, 1980, uh, unions were already on the decline. Uh, who would have known 40 years later that it would be as bad as it is now? But anyway, I did see the union as, a, as an important vehicle for trying to get people uh, and get my own sense of voice, capacity, sense of collective power, and so wanted to be in a situation uh, where 
I could organize and express that. So I found, I found myself in the Teamsters, not just because that's the job that I got down the street, but I had a, I was part of a group that had a political perspective that said, there's some key sectors of the economy that we want to root ourselves in to try and remake the unions into fighting forces that could then help make a more fighting force within society. And so I ended up in the Teamsters, you know, primarily Teamsters are known as truck drivers, but the union itself is about 1.3 million and includes people that wear the Mickey Mouse mask at Disney World or our university clericals or our nurses in Flint, Michigan, or our unfortunately correction officers. But so it's a lot more than truck drivers, but the largest proportion in the union is about 300,000 plus UPS workers who are both drivers that you see in the little brown trucks, but also tractor trailer drivers that move freight to those little brown trucks. But about half the workforce is folks that work in large warehouses, moving the packages that you get on your doorstep or whatever into the trucks and out of the trucks. And the demographics of those workers in the warehouses are tend to be young because they're only three hour shifts, tend to be black, brown, yellow, red, all sorts of colors, uh, women and men, um, and are underpaid for this co corporation that makes billions of dollars. So one of the fights in our union is around UPS as an employer and organizing those 300,000 uh, workers into a fighting force that will challenge not just on their wages and benefits, but also raise the issue of how they work, how we work, how essential we are, what kind of working conditions do we need if they're going to claim that we're so essential, and sort of pushing back on what could be done in terms of that kind of workplace activity. Our hope is that as that unfolds, especially over the next two years in the run up to the contract, that that will have an impact on Amazon as well. So there's thousands and thousands of folks working at Amazon and non-union workplaces. The hope is that uh, the hope, the goal, the organizing is towards trying to impact what's going on at Amazon because Amazon is UPS on steroids. And if we don't find a way to address Amazon and, the, and its impact on our, on our economy and on our culture, uh, we're really gonna be in a tough spot. So that's been one area of work by my work in the Teamsters and I'm more than willing to fee, field questions on the Teamsters or other such matters uh, when we get to further discussion. The other area of work that I've done over the last 40 years is there's been a publication called labor notes. And I'm going to post both the link for TDU, my caucus within the Teamsters, and also labor notes, the publication in the chat. But anyway, labor notes is sort of the umbrella publication and organization of folks like myself that have been active in the labor movement over the last 40 years. And uh, Margaret referenced the Longshore, Longshore Union. There's folks from the Longshore Workers in there. Todd, I know, and his folks at, at Rutgers AAUP have been connected in different ways to labor notes. Uh, Teamsters, obviously, auto workers, et cetera. But if you want to know what's going on at the grassroots level of um, stuff going on in the unions and in worker centers and things like that, Labor Nuts is a great resource to take a look at. They also publish a, a bunch of books, one called Secrets of a Successful Organizer, which while it's oriented towards the workplace, I think is still a useful publication for anybody uh, doing political work or thinking about organizing and thinking about moving people. So those have been two of the main projects I've been involved in over the years. Um, currently, I'm active in Democratic Socialists of America. And as a recent retiree now, I have a lot more spare time. So I'm also working on projects related to DSA, both in Detroit and nationally. One of the projects that we're exploring and we've been doing for a long time is related to labor or making, making what's our title, making uh, labor work is um, I'm always looking for folks to repopulate uh, union workplaces, especially key sectors. So while there's been an uptick in terms of the amount of sort of graduate student organizing nationally over the last 10, 15 years, and many graduate students have joined unions and you know have a certain power, in a certain sense, that's been the growth industry, at least for the union establishment as graduate students. Um, but uh, I, I'm always up for a conversation with student radicals or others about what do you do besides going to graduate school and what options there might be. And uh, 
what particular sectors might be useful. I know that um, NGOs, non-government organizations of various stripes, scales, and sizes have been one sort of way of channeling uh, student activists or radicals. Um, I, have, I have serious questions about NGOs and the limitations of NGOs uh, and their independence ultimately given where their funding comes from. But uh, I, would, I certainly am, am available to advocate for other, other ways of doing good political work while getting paid to do it. And I'm sure Margaret and uh, Todd will have other ideas as well, but uh, making labor work is gonna mean, you know, for all intents and purposes, most people have to figure out ways of sustaining themselves, right? So if you're, if you're a thoughtful person, or as Jen would say, a critical thinker, you know, think critically about how you wanna spend your time sustaining yourself and what impact that's gonna have on your immediate relations, but also relationships, you know, beyond your immediate circle and how that could uh, help us make our lives different. Uh, I'll just stop there and give you a peace sign, Craig. You can, I'll cede my, I'll cede my two minutes. That, you don't have to cede your time, but if you want I'll to throw my two minutes to Brother Wilson, or maybe he'll uh, end up with, you know, eight or 10, and that'll save more time for talking with uh, other folks. All right. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Todd, uh, yeah, take it away, Todd. Yeah, um, thank you both, Peter and Margaret. Um, so I, I, I want to talk about like the work I'm most focused on right now um, and tell a story to kind of kind of bring it to life and um, and just say it's it's about the struggle over the future of public higher education. So it connects to some comments that both Peter and Margaret made, and um, um, and and I want to argue that if we can figure out the fight. Uh, there, we can. It can help us reimagine the public good, the public sector, which is an important thing to fight over. Um, and also, I think it has ways of telling us some ways forward about the future of the labor movement and and some steps forward. And I'll start with some work at Rutgers during the pandemic, and then um, some work we're trying to do at the national level. And this is a lot of people, so um, in no in no way is it me. Um, there's many people involved, but there's an important context here, which is just like labor. Public higher education has been in a long crisis, right? Um, over the last 40 years um, and rapidly accelerating in the last two decades, our public education systems and public higher ed have descended into like crisis that's been driven by federal and state divestment. Um, and this divestment began in the 60s and 70s and began just at the time that uh, black people and people of color more broadly were getting access to free public higher education. And that's important that they, there's an inverse ratio. The more people of color got access to public higher ed, the less funding went to it. And also the divestment happened after the long 60s where um, our campuses, universities and campuses across the country were a critical site of struggle, right? And so post that, there's been a massive disinvestment of our public universities um, and this has led to what we could call the corporate or neoliberal university, um, one that prioritizes, and even the public one that prioritizes the bottom line over all else. Um, and the people that run our institutions have run them and do run them, whether it's Wayne State or Mich University of Michigan or Rutgers, they run them like private corporations, not like big public institutions, right? Um, and this shift is on that upended the sector um, for workers, for students, for, for the communities our, our universities are in. And let's just flag, let me flag a couple of things. One is rising tuition over the last 50 years, which has produced massive student debt, massive student debt, 1.7 trillion, most of it never to be paid back, but people just uh, suffocated by the kind of debt and the debt obligations. But not only students, all of our institutions, Rutgers just took out a century loan. They won't pay it back. It's like a billion dollars, but they won't start paying it back for a hundred years. It's, fuck, it's lunacy. Um, so there's that. There's also that our education has been unlike this course. And I'm so thankful, Craig and David, for the work you're doing. A lot of our higher ed has been commodified and marketized, right? And it's not about creating a citizen a rebellious citizen, a democratic engaged citizen is about creating someone who can get a job on the market. Um, it's also led to really degraded work conditions. And let's just flag adjunct faculty, 75% of classes taught by adjuncts. They have no job security, few benefits, and it's they're suffering, right? Um, and somehow it's this hidden secret in higher ed. Um, 
But more than that, also they've narrowed what was once called shared governance. Um, they've attacked tenure, they've attacked academic freedom, um, and they prioritized the bottom line over the core mission of our universities and colleges, which is teaching research service. And importantly, a new book just came out in the shadow of the ivory tower, which also shows how urban universities are are um, vampires and they're sucking the life out of their urban communities as opposed to creating symbiotic relationships. Um, and so alongside that long crisis is the acute crisis of the pandemic. Since the pandemic hit 700,000 people in the sector, 14% of the higher ed sector have been laid off. Um, so I was president when the pandemic hit. Um, and as uh, Craig was saying, we have about 8,000 members. We have full-time faculty, grad workers, postdocs, counselors. Um, and the pandemic hit Jersey hard. Um, it was one of the first places it hit hard. Um, and, um, and what our vision was, was how do we use the pandemic to build a new form of solidarity at the university across all workers and with students? So that was the vision that we had. We started talking about when the pandemic hit. So when the pandemic hit, the administration that runs Rutgers started moaning about the economic impact. And we knew exactly what they were going to do because historically institutions like Rutgers have done this always. And a crisis hits and they attempt to ride it out on the most the backs of the most vulnerable, right? Fire people, lay them off, furlough folks, and go after the most precarious, usually low-wage workers, often people of color and women, right? That's what these institutions always do, and we knew it's what Rutgers was going to do. So our response was to organize all workers on campus into a coalition and to get out in front of the university and propose what we were calling a people-centered approach to the pandemic. And so our approach was really simple, right? They couldn't do anything to full-time tenured faculty, which are a part of my base. Um, and so what we proposed was this thing called a work share program, where we take some of the money from the CARES Act, we take some of the money from New Jersey unemployment, and we furlough. And the, the, the federal and state money keeps everyone making under $200,000 a year whole, right? The university saves $100 million, and what we made these demands, right? No layoffs, no layoffs, period, end of sentence. No layoffs to staff, no layoffs to dining staff, no layoffs to adjuncts, no layoffs to dorm staff. An extra year of funding for all grad workers, um, support for our international students because they were not eligible for care, the CARES Act COVID support. Um, and then importantly, free COVID testing in the three major cities Rutgers sits in, Newark, New Brunswick, and, and Camden. Uh, so folks could find out if they had COVID, right? Um, and those were our demands. We felt like we could save huge amounts of money. Um, and, um, and the real goal was to build this massive coalition of all students and workers at Rutgers. It's 100,000 people, 30,000 workers, 70,000 students. So it's big and it touches all the lives of everyone in Jersey. Um, it was a, a united front strategy. Um, we bargained, the university ultimately rejected it. And, and after they rejected it, they laid off a thousand workers, disproportionately women and people of color, adjuncts. Um, and they stripped them of their friggin' healthcare in the middle of a friggin' pandemic. It's like, this is a public institution, so unethical. Um, but we kept the pressure on. We organized work actions across the university. We had community actions. We had this huge community uh, 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 demonstration where folks in New Brunswick, which is largely, I'd say, well over 50% uh, undocumented Spanish speaking uh, folks, uh, came out in support of the workers and in, around the demand for free COVID testing. Um, and we were able to force them back to the table through work actions and political pressure. And we ultimately won a bunch of things. We won the ability to get everyone hired back. Um, we got all of our grad workers or the majority of one year extension. We did get free COVID testing in the community and we got uh, job security. So no layoffs uh, of anybody moving forward. Um, but most importantly, what we were able to win through this was a sense of solidarity. And so the, the important point here is that faculty, particularly tenured faculty, don't see themselves and have not seen themselves as workers. And because of that, the most privileged part of a big sector has not been part of a fight, right? And so what we wanted to do is shift the ideological ter terrain through this, force faculty to, to take a hit, so to speak, not much of one, but go into a furlough program in order to defend the jobs of low-wage workers on our campus in the hopes that that could build a much deeper sense of solidarity and coalition um, at the university. 
Um, and so it, it worked to a degree. I mean, it's, it's still a work in progress, obviously. Um, and, but we, you know, some of the lessons we learned is um, one, most importantly, the people who run our public institutions can't do it. They are not and have no right to run our institutions. They don't care about them. Um, two, thank you, Craig. Two, that um, to win these things, you have to have a strong organized infrastructure, right? We had we sent about 150 people to a McAlevey strike school class to learn to be better department reps. And that was really an anchor for our work. Um, three, we have to get out of this craft union approach to our workplaces. Um, a craft union for students means I only organize with the people in my job category, right? So if I'm a faculty member, I organize only with faculty members. If I'm a dining staff worker, I organize only with dining staff workers. If I'm a student, or a student worker, I organize only with student workers. That will never enable us to have the power we need to fight the fights in front of us. So we have to move towards an industrial approach or a wall-to-wall -wall approach to our big institutions. Um, also, we have to fight over the governance of our institutions. Um, and so we need to build work councils in our institutions because our contracts are simply not enough. They govern some part of the, the life of our organizations, but not enough. And so we need to pivot towards a bigger vision of governance. And also, and this goes to Margaret's points earlier, we must have a community and student approach, at least in the university and in, for, for labor with, with larger uh, worker community approach um, that builds a larger front of struggle. Um, and the last thing I'll say is we also need to build a national formation. So we've been doing that. We built this thing called Higher Ed Labor United, which is now 100 unions across the country in higher ed, all work categories from community college to four-year publics and privates um, with a vision of a building an alignment around a national agenda, but also importantly, learning from the Red State Rebellion that Margaret was flagging of K-12 teachers. We are all going into a militant, we hope we're going into a militant phase in higher ed. We need to coordinate it. Right. So if UAW grad workers in the California system go on strike and my union goes on strike, we need to both coordinate our strikes and we need to lift up the issues we can't solve at the university level. There are some state and national issues. And so if we can coordinate this militant wave of higher ed workers, we can both create a national political crisis around higher ed while fighting on our campuses. So I'll end there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Todd. Um... Margaret and Peter, so many different issues um, that we could now dive into. And also thank you for being so great with your time because we now have what is probably a record amount of time for discussion in a Detroiter Speak series. Usually we don't have so much time. We've start, students have started to ask some good questions here. Um, and I wanna keep encouraging students to post questions and also folks on our YouTube channel if they wanna post a question. And, and I, I, I'm, I think Miku, um, I'll just go ahead and read the first question that came up and then, you know, keep posing them. We're not going to get to every question, but we may, we may grab this one or grab that one, depending on how the discussion goes. Um, but there's two questions that came up that I think are somewhat related uh, to this, so the, the care income, uh, sort of the care, care workers more broadly that, that anybody can speak to. And certainly, you know, Margaret, Margaret has spoken a lot to this, but anybody can answer this question. And the first one from Donine is, do you worry mothers may lose their children more often if they are being paid to take care of them. Donian says, I worry that the government or other families might feel more entitled to our kids if we're being paid to take care of them. I'm gonna add this second question because I think it fits into this and maybe to expand the question a little bit. Uh, Zehao Tong says, an alternative to the care income is the total socialization of housework, public agencies to take care of the elder and children of a community, public cafeterias, cleaning and laundry services, et cetera. What do you think about this alternative and its pros and cons compared to the care income? So they're both talking about how do we imagine and think about paying people in our society who are already doing this work um, in some sort of wage-based form, I guess, uh, is my understanding. But can, can you speak about this idea of, of socialization of housework and how we might think about um, compensation of work that, of course, has always been done from the very beginning of time? Margaret, I don't know if you want to start. You don't have to start on that one, but... Um, Sure, and, and anybody could, could weigh in, I'd, I'd be glad for that. But um, when it comes to the state basically taking your children uh, because you're getting more income in, in the household, I mean, I don't think there's any other worker that that argument could be made to say, well, if you 
get a decent wage at the university or if you get paid at whatever job um, you, you're doing, that that's going to give you less power and less rights because that's really what we're talking about. I mean, if you look at with COVID, um, domestic violence shot up, right? And one of the things that we were concerned about in terms of even the, the child tax credit, we didn't win on this fight, but we said, you know what? That money needs to go to the primary caregiver. If it's the mom, it's a primary caregiver, a grandma, a auntie, or a dad. But one of the reasons we were concerned about that is that we did not want women who are vulnerable to domestic violence, for example, to be even more vulnerable because there's more money coming into the household but not coming to her directly, right? So, you know, that, that whole, the, the argument, and if you really think about it, for those of us who were enslaved, we didn't get less power because we started to win a wage. You know what I mean? That it, 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 we, we, we are still fighting for freedom and we're still fighting for power. So I think when it comes to women and when it comes to caregiver, and perhaps it's because people are so used to the fact that it's done for free and you should be do it for free. Why? Because it's in your nature, you know, anyway, that's, that's a whole other debate. So I, I would say that, that in fact, what we have found and, and the chair, the, the ch child tax credit has been an example of that because they found that um, with the child tax credit, with more money coming into the household, the children really benefited and the entire family uh, benefited. And it meant that rather than have your water shut off and then them come take your kids, there's some income perhaps to help with that bill. You know what I mean? And when the social worker comes to your house and checks the fridge, hey, there's very little food in this fridge. Maybe we should start a case on you and take your child. You know what I mean? You, you have, you, it, it's more resources. So it's a better protection. Um, the thing about uh, socialization, um, you know, we, as moms, we do want a break. We do need a break. But I have to say that, you know, we cannot dismiss the bond that happens with babies. I mean, I think of babies and um, who go into childcare. I don't know if you all have ever heard the phrase flathead babies. I don't know if you all got a flathead. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm not trying to talk bad about you. But what happens is that you got those babies that are, instead of being held, instead of being breastfed, instead of having that human contact, the ratio, if you think about it, if you're a parent, I had a hard enough time taking care of one daughter, much less having four or five babies that I'm responsible for, right? And the kind of socialized care, which we're seeing in some of these um, care facilities. We also see it with elder care right now. You talk to your elders and ask them, do you want to go into one of those? They're going to be like, hell no, I want to stay in my house. OK, so I think that, you know, we, we have to really rethink um, how society itself is organized and what the priorities are. And if the priorities are the caring of people and the caring of the environment, you have a very, very different mindset and a very, very different approach to how you're going to um, do what part of it is, is socialized, what part of it people have the right to be able to breastfeed and raise their own child to a certain age. So I'm not, we don't know all of the answers because right now we're living under such oppression, I think, that we're really trying to figure out our way out from under it. But we do know that we want the choice to be able to care for our elders, care for the land, care, care for our children, feed healthy food, not have all that crap because that's all you could afford to, to, to eat is, is the Mac meals or whatever. And a lot of those skills I have to say are also being lost uh, because we're so in the mindset that we gotta get out and make the money and get all the stuff that the, the, the care, the time that it takes to think about what you're eating, to prepare the meal, to go out in the garden and maybe get a little kitchen garden going, which is what I grew up with. If not, who knows what would have happened to us. That time is gone. Right. So yeah, that, that's it. You know, Fanon talks, Franz Fanon talks about creating a new human being. We really have to be in the process of that. And 
the National Welfare Rights Union, they, they're talking about welfare, not only the right to cash income, but the right for everybody to fare well, for the entire class to fare well. If you talk to Maureen Taylor or Marion or all of them, you will hear them talk about this. And I think listen to those voices uh, from the bottom as well to get some idea of the direction to go in. Thank you so much, Margaret. I want to switch gears to a different question. Um, every question that is raised, of course, we could go on for a while with, but we're going to try and get a few different ones. So, and I believe my friend and collaborator, David Goldberg, who's going to be unmuted in a moment, is going to pose a question. So, David? Yeah, uh, don't call me a collaborator. Um, <laughs> but my, my question to you is this. Uh, I had read this in the chat, and I just wanted to kind of raise it because I think it's a really thoughtful organizing question. And, and I think that's, you know, really what we hope to gain from this is that we're trying to gain an understanding to help us move. Uh, so I want to pose this question to you all, but then I also want to raise a point for our students, particularly mine, to think about. Uh, and the first question was about a student who had talked about submitting an op-ed to uh, the Michigan Daily at University of Michigan on the abolition of the university's presidency, uh, which was timely for sure at U of M and uh, administration and establish a staff, faculty, and student council in its stead, what we used to call uh, faculty and student governance. They haven't gotten back to me yet, unfortunately. So just curious if you have any comments and advice for this project so it might get somewhere. So it's an idea, how do we organize around it? And then the second part is about uh, housing. You know. Todd was talking about the manipulation of particularly urban universities like Wayne and universities that don't have large endowments. And one of the things that we're locked into at Wayne State is a housing boondoggle with a company called Corvius. And if any of you have been watching in the news what's been going on with student protests at Howard University is that this public private partnership, they don't call it outright privatization, because it doesn't behoove them to privatize it. By leasing the property, they actually make more money because they don't have to pay taxes, right? And they build these things to fall apart and they make students pay double for it and the universities get screwed. So I would be happy to send all of you the contracts, which I have, uh, and for you all to start thinking about what kind of university you want to be in, what fair housing looks like to you, right? And what is important for you all, because I think this will echo some of the comments that will be made about organizing. We can't organize as people who work technically at the university, unless we organize with you all who are working at the university in your classes. So I'll just leave it there. And I thank you all, this has been wonderful. I can respond first, and then I don't know if Peter or Mar Margaret want to jump in. So just uh, two points. One, I, I like the housing question is a really important one. So we are going into, my union uh, is going into a contract campaign, and we have been working with the community groups in Newark, New Brunswick and Camden, and undergrads, and also gra international grad students. And we, we're building a strategy to demand that Rutgers, which is the biggest landlord, at least in New Brunswick, um, stabilize rents. And at the least, they don't raise rents. And it's not only because that will help our undergrad students and our international grad students, but also because, be, because they're the biggest market in New Brunswick, it will bring down or stabilize rents across the entirety of the city, which will then have a, a powerful impact on commu the community, which I, as I said earlier, is I'd say 60% 60, 60 undocumented um, Spanish speaking um, and the, they work, uh, the, those uh, folks work in light industry that's sur sort of in the middle of New Jersey. And so we want to build a demand that connects faculty and workers to undergrads to, um, to community. Um, and so we're trying to work through what that looks like and how to make that demand. Um, but I think these are the questions of how our urban universities in particular abuse the communities they're in is a really important one for students and workers to engage collectively with communities. Um, and then is it Zay How? Is that how you say it? You said that, David. I hope I got it right. Um, and sorry if I didn't. Um, like we're in the same brain space right now, I'll just say. 
Um, I, uh, two things. So like University of Wisconsin, which is one of the most storied public universities, just hired as the chancellor of the whole system, a frigging corporate lawyer to run their frigging institute. It makes no sense. The guy's never been to a public institution. He went to like Harvard and, and, and now he's going to run UW, which importantly, historically, is the institution that probably had the most publicly engaged kind of university. At a certain point, point in history, University of Wisconsin faculty were working with the legislature and they it passed in 1911, check this out, the University of Wisconsin led in passing the first income tax, the first uh, living wage law in, in the country, the first factor, factory safety regulations in the country. Um, they helped limit women and children uh, work time and they passed unemployment compensation. That was the University of Wisconsin, right? A hundred years ago or 110 years ago. Now they have a corporate lawyer running their institution. So we have to get rid of these presidents. And my mind is in the same place it houses, which is we need to build workers' councils. And there are models out there, not in the US, unfortunately, but in Europe and North Europe and, and Germany, they have they have works councils that are both in private and public institutions that we can learn from. But then also, if you look at South and Central America, like University of Mexico, Mexico City is an autonomous university. Students, faculty, and staff are voted onto a board that autonomously runs UNAM. Um, they get a budget from the federal government, and that's it. They decide who's the president. They decide what happens. We need that in the U.S. And I think our universities and colleges are a place to sort of establish a vision for works councils that could then hopefully migrate into the private sector as well. They tried it at VW in Tennessee, I don't know, like 10 years ago, and, and that didn't go well. But I think we need to reimagine it again. Thank you, Todd. We have another question, but let's let's uh, before we get to that one, Peter, do you want to add anything to what you've been hearing in the, in the first few responses? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the question gets to who rules the university and how, and that's the same question for the broader society. And if critical thinkers and students can be raising those sorts of questions at the, at the level of the university, it's bound to filter out or ripple out, you know, to the rest of us. I would say, however, that, you know, ideas are a dime a dozen. The, the point is to move, you know, how do you move and organize around the idea? So it's one thing, I think it's a good idea to get an op-ed into the Michigan Daily or whatever, but that's that's it, you know, uh, then what? So, uh, you know, Todd's outlined some of the things that they've done up to this point at Rutgers. I think there's a lot to be learned there. And he's also outlined the limitations of that and what they need to do to move beyond that. Um, I'm, I'm in that mindset as, as well, but, uh, when I was at university, it was, um, I treated it sort of as a small pond playground. I could learn a lot and there was a lot to learn in that, in that uh, space in terms of how things, how power worked, how things were governed, how people reacted and interacted and related. But then you get, you know, what, what happens beyond the university walls, um, obviously at Rutgers, Wayne, everywhere else, those institutions, U of M in Ann Arbor, have an impact on the surrounding city, community, et cetera, but um, it is kind of, you know, use that time, use those three, four, whatever years as idealized time to figure things out and become critical thinkers, but then figure out how you're gonna translate what you learned or those ideas into, you know, real world impacts. Thank you, Peter. And Mira, Mira has a question in the chat, which you probably all read, but I'm just gonna read it in case people didn't. I have a related question, more like description. There's currently a fight for 15 wage campaign on our campus and points have been raised uh, around the campaign if there could have been more effective measures of labor organizing. I was wondering if any of you had any thoughts on union organizing for student workers or how to produce more structural change. And I believe there was a, another part to it, I guess specifically factoring in the nature of student organizing. Uh, which Peter was just pointing towards a little bit. So any thoughts? And Fight for 15, of course, is a national campaign, right? Um, and we now know that we need Fight for 25, right? And probably needed it a long time ago. But in any case, any thoughts on this question by Mira? Um, whomever wants to start can. Hi, what about I have some you? Thoughts. Yeah. yeah, I could say so. I just went on so much last time that I was trying to like step back. But um, 
I'll, I'll just say, Mira, that, you know, in our last contract campaign, we demanded 15 an hour for all campus workers. Um, we'd worked with students. We didn't win it. Um, so we have that demand back on the table. Um, but I do think that, one, I think the situation of our uh, college student organizing is actually in a pretty low point right now and is a problem. It's a real problem. The, there's been national organizations like United Students Against Sweatshop that are actually not really strong at this moment. And there's not, there's not much in the national level. And I see a lot, a lot less at the um, local level. So we have to figure that out. Here's Levi, Levi say hi. Um, and, um, and I think, but I do think to mirror to your point, having student workers build with um, the labor unions on campus to make a shared demand will make it a much more powerful thing. And also students should align themselves to a union if possible. Um, it's, it's a really hard way to go without um, some support and some, I'm gonna stop, um, okay. He's got some caregiving duties to take care of. You know, I, I don't know, Mira, if, if I, I mean, I'm, I'm not a student, haven't done student organizing in a while. I did, um, for a while I was in, in CUNY at the City University of New York um, in the SEEK program. If people know about that program, we did a lot of organizing there. One of the things uh, that we were able to do was to win um, childcare on campus. And what we did is that we insisted that it would be for uh, uh, students, faculty, staff, and cleaning. I mean, whoever had a job at, at the university because they were ready to, you know, cut a deal. I suppose, Todd, it's like you were saying about having to bring everybody together. They're always ready to carve you up and say, okay, well, maybe we'll do something for the faculty or maybe we'll just do something for the students. But if you're cleaning in the, in the cafeteria, you know, forget about it. I, I do remember when my daughter was in, in university, you know, she was involved with some of that organizing. Um, and one of the things that they found effective, because being a student is work, you do have that heavy workload, is they had a system where they said, if you've got um, three hours, this is what you can do. If you've got two hours, this is what you can do. If you got 10 minutes, this is what, I mean, I, I really was fascinated by that because they literally had a time breakdown and ways for, for people to feel that they could be involved if they couldn't be like the full-time, you know, organizer or the person, you know, putting in uh, all of the time. And it was, it was much more inclusive. Um, in that way. And uh, there was also an example from um, in Ireland, actually, the University of Galway, of some women in our network there that did what I suppose Reverend Barber from the Poor People's Campaign, which I'm also active with on uh, um, the California Coordinating Committee, calls that kind of fusion organizing that we really have to look up uh, coming across uh, sectors that way. You talk about the low level of, of organizing happening by students. So, it, you know, when we looked at that massive movement, the Black Lives Matter movement that broke out, there were a lot of students. They weren't necessarily on the campus, you know, dealing with an issue on the campus, right? But it was the broader uh, Black Lives Matter movement. and. Uh, looking at what is happening now, the repression happening of the against the the teaching, the true history of the United States, the banning of books, the the intimidation of teachers. I imagine that's happening at the university level, not only at uh, K through twelve. This is some very serious crap that's going on here. I mean, this is like George beyond George Orwell, nineteen eighty four, and it's deep. Deeply, deeply racist, um, homophobic, you know, anti-Semitic. I mean, all of that stuff is there. So, you know, something you have to assume that wherever there's oppression, people are going to be pushing back and organizing against it. And I, I know for a lot of us, I know I feel that myself, even as a, as a black, you feel like 
oh my God, there's so much crap happening right now. You walk out the door, you don't know if you're going to get shot. Your kid goes down to the store. Are they going to get back home in one piece? I mean, there's so many ways in which you're feeling under attack. And I imagine the young people, that must be happening. The environmental crisis, the, you know, the whole crap. And it's like trying to figure that out and trying to find your way through that. And a kind of a fusion approach, Todd, which I think you've described really very, very well um, is, is, is one path that we can begin for people to find their way without feeling depressed, without feeling hopeless, like what the crap. I mean, I look now at what's happening with voting rights. My cousin Martha Prescott was in SNCC. She was down in bloody Mississippi, you know what I mean? Surrounded by racists with weapons you know, fighting for the right to vote. And now look at what is happening uh, right now. How do you not lose heart? How do young people not feel like, what's the point of all of it? So I, I just think that that may be part of what you're sensing right now is feeling like things are on, on a low ebb, but maybe they're doing something else out in the community that is not necessarily connected to, to the campus. You know what I'm saying? So I think we got to look at all of that as well. Thank you, Margaret. Peter, do you want to add anything to this question around student organizing? I have, I have a question queued up as well. And I think Miku just put one in and we have time for maybe two or three more, but Peter, is there anything you wanted to add into the mix? No, I'm fine, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, Miku, go ahead and read your question, Miku. You can unmute yourself, I know. Okay, yeah, so mine is kind of a little bit redundant in the first part, but um, still related to student organizing. So how do you organize in a workplace with high turnover rates, such as university? Um, and how do we organize beyond the short-term job into the time that we aren't working but are unified as a student body? So I know like a lot of students do work like just a couple of hours a week or um, change jobs within the university or change things from semester to semester. So should we keep that organizing from semester to semester, even just as students and not as student workers? And where should we be making connections on campus and off? Um, I guess I can start, I'll try to be brief. So um, those are really good, really hard questions. Uh, first, I do wanna say, Margaret, I agree, I do think, that students have been fighting off our campuses and that's important. Um, I guess I'm also trying to flag that like organizationally we're weak at, at this, around student organizing. It's, le it's probably less students. Um, and this is on campuses in particular, I'm not speaking beyond our campuses, but organizationally, we just don't have much that's kind of building a united force. And it's really hard to do that work if you don't have those formations. But to me, to your really difficult questions, um, so in my union, we have grad workers. Grad workers are often in and out within five years. Um, what makes it complex is that one contract that they're in the fight for is the one thing, right? And so everything has to happen in that contract. And so the relationship between winning and building a long-term militant union versus winning everything in one contract becomes a real complex uh, navigation, I, I'll just say from my vantage. And I say that saying that grad workers are the heartbeat of higher ed labor movement. And I'm so indebted to them and inspired by them. And also having to run a union that has faculty and grad workers and adjuncts, there's just a complication um, around like the one contract versus seeing uh, like a terrain over like 10 years or whatever. So, but in terms of like holding folks, um, for us, we try to bring people in right away, get them into political education and organizing programs as soon as they become a member of our unit. Um, and then we have a ladder, like any good organization, you know, just like uh, the, the vision that comes out of Detroit of, of getting people politically connected and committed and seeing their accountability and vision and focus. And as they engage more, they move up with responsibility. And I think that's the, that's, uh, I mean, that's just one way of doing it for for a short, quick turnover. Um, five years isn't that quick. It's not the same as like a student, undergrad student worker that might be at the shop for a, a year. Um, but that's how we approach it. Um, and But our membership of our grad workers is always lower than our membership of any of our other workers. And that's because of the, the transitional, the trans, 
it's all na- nature of the work. Um, but I think getting folks in, getting them connected and getting them uh, connected to a political project is really important as quickly as possible. And then thinking about a ladder of engagement. Um, and the only other thing I'll say is that being involved in, at a material struggle at your workplace, for me, I think it's a really important thing for folks and it really develops them. But as we've been talking about, and I think Margaret's really pressed us on, and I, I want to flag is also being connected to organizing in your community and figuring out what those connections are and how to make them um, is really important. We've worked really hard to try to build those connections between students and community groups in New Brunswick, Newark, and Camden. It could be hard. And students, and you, there's a lot of students here, but sometimes students could be jackasses. And, and you're putting them in like very kind of important relational moments. And so sometimes that's also like something to really think through and navigate. But, um, but it, I think those are really important questions. Sorry, I can't be more concrete. Thank you, Todd. I'm going to pose our final question. And then I'd like to ask, um, you know, each of our speakers just to give, you know, give us your 90 second wrap up um, so we can we can end on time. Um, and it, I want to direct the question to Peter, but I'd be curious to see what Todd and Margaret think. Peter, you mentioned Amazon and it, it, it seems to me in so many ways that a potential mass organizing campaign around Amazon could be an absolutely galvanizing campaign in the next several years. Um, and I say, I'll just give you one way that I've thought about it recently. And I just be curious if you could tell us more about how you see that campaign unfolding potentially uh, at its best. Everybody, and what seems to me one of the most unique things about Amazon is that we all live in the workplace, right? Everybody sees an Amazon worker coming down their street. So I feel like unlike almost any other <laughs> workplace where you have to go inside a place and you're just with your workers, we live in the workplace. And obviously there's, there's warehouses and all that stuff that we don't live in. But I mean, a huge number of the people that we want to talk to and help to galvanize we're meeting and seeing every day in our neighborhood. So it's, it seems to me like there's a like pretty unique potential in some ways for an Amazon campaign to cut across so many different boundaries um, since we all in so many different ways encounter Amazon workers. Um, so I don't know how that resonates with you, Peter, or even just more generally, help us think more together a little bit about what, why, we, why we should get excited about a potential Amazon campaign. Well, Amazon is about how we consume and they are determining how we consume. So uh, I love reading. I get lots of books. I get lots of books from all sorts of sources, but I get them from Amazon because it's the most convenient and I've got Amazon Prime and I don't have to pay for the shipping. But it's, you know, that book, you know, what impact has that had on the environment? What impact has that had on the workers that have had to move it? What, you know, impact has that had on, on even how we consume knowledge? So Amazon is, um, well, it's like the word, it's huge. And one of the dilemmas we face in organizing at Amazon is there's such a high turnover rate of folks that are there. So I think if we're gonna organize Amazon, it's gotta be understood as sort of a community or a community and economy sort of thing, a systemic sort of thing. I mean, if Amazon continues at the rate that it's going, it's going to be, you know, it is the determiner of how we, how we uh, live our lives. And given that capitalism is into you know, it's not, in, Amazon would say, well, we're here to serve the consumer. No, you're here to create the consumer in order to create profit for Jeff Bezos and everybody else. I mean, the other dilemma with Amazon is the warehouse and distribution and circulation project is only one aspect of Amazon's might. I mean, the, their big money is in computer servers for the way the rest of the economy runs. I don't know the 21st century tech, you know, verbiage for it, but the 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 server warehouses that they have, you know, in New Jersey, in Washington state. And that's also determining how, how we run our lives, how banking happens, how all sorts of commerce happens, et cetera, et cetera. So we're really up against a Goliath, which isn't to say that we can't take on Goliath as David. It's all about people. It's all about people buying. It's all about people moving the stuff. It's all about people and their relationships, right? I mean, it's, 
structured by Amazon, but it's, it's still all about relationships among, among people. And so again, it sort of gets to climate change and everything else. How do we want to make our lives? Is Amazon making our lives better or worse and why and how? And you know, how do we address that? I don't think the union establishment as we know it today, and I would make that distinction between the union establishment and the working people. I don't think the union establishment has the politics perspective or analysis at this point to be able to conceive of taking on that Goliath of capital, but that's where we need to get. Thank you so much, Peter. Before we do some final thoughts, Todd or Margaret, did you have any, any things you wanted to add to this sort of the big Amazon elephant in the on the planet, I guess you could say? Well, not really. I mean, only just in a way underscoring what has just been said, because you know, when you look at COVID and the impact of uh, COVID and the fact that a lot of, of people now are, don't want to go into the big box stores, you know, they do want to, you know, order online. And then if you are a, 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 a mom or a dad, <laughs> like Todd, with some little ones around you and you're trying to work, plus you're trying to take care of them. So you, you want to do the most uh, convenient uh, thing. And that, you know, the, the way that our time is so consumed by just trying to survive, you know, trying to, uh, you know, keep the job, keep the, the roof over your head, etc. It doesn't really give you the time to do perhaps what you might think to be the right thing. Okay, not to order the book from Amazon, but maybe to go to, to you know, try to go to like a little local bookshop to get it right which i have i mean i ordered i ordered something from a, a local uh, shop that was a, a gift for my daughter and her husband you know it has yet to arrive you know what i mean if i did that on amazon they would have had it by now so it's it's not only amazon and that delivery but it, it goes back to the point that i was making even about cooking about food about everything we do our time is so pressed by this bloody system, whatever you, you, you want to call it, capitalism, that we're really not able to be the, 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 the kind of human beings and the kinds of caring for each other in the way that we would, including what we're going to do. Because, you know, I do know, you know, order from Amazon, Peter, I'm sure you don't feel great about it, right? But you know, as you say, you got Amazon Prime, you're gonna get your book. So I think that, it, you know, the organizing of Amazon and Amazon workers can't be seen outside of all of the other interrelated things. And I know that seems like a big picture, a lot to take on, but I look at what the Poor People's Campaign is doing, for example, and bringing those issues together organizing, you know, with Amazon workers, the fight for 15, also around um, the, the right to vote and the refusal to um, divide those issues, you know, uh, of saying, no, I'm not going to say that this one, you know, the racism and, or poverty, like pick one, you know, pick your fight, refusing to do that. I think increasingly we have to do that in a lot of ways. If not, we're all going to be screwed because it may look like we have won at Amazon, you know, but two years later down the road, guess what? You may not win at Amazon. Look at what the hell happened with voting rights. You know what I'm saying? So it, it really has to be a, a broader, more holistic um, approach. And I sure as hell am going to support as I can in terms of media coverage and everything else for the organizing happening at Amazon. And you're hopeful and I do, I'm on, I'm optimist in that way, do remain hopeful that um, a breakthrough will happen and that it will be an example like those, um, what was it Starbucks workers? Where is it uh, upstate New York? Uh, that one that all of those little victories we have to look at and build on, I think, and be hopeful, continue Great. to do the work. <laughs> Go ahead, Todd. Oh, yeah, thank you, Mark. Go ahead, yeah, Todd. I just want to make three quick points. One, and, and this is like for all of us, but also for the students. One thing that Margaret said, I just want to flag, which is that the thing about capitalism is that it flattens us. Like all of our social relations tend to then revolve around the market 
and and um, commodity as opposed to like the full understanding of what we could be. And so your, your story about like your relationship to buying something from a mom and pop store versus store versus getting it from Amazon and the speed and all that, it just brings that to life. What, how capitalism flattens us um, in these really sad, hard ways to deal with. Two other quick points. One, and this goes all the way back to the beginning uh, and like all the way back to even uh, drum and the vision there, which is the thing about Amazon is it's such an important point of leverage to organize. Um, and it, it like, it's such a critical site being the center of logistics. Um, I'm just worried that Teamsters have bit off more than they can chew. And only um, Peter can really tell us that. Um, and they've gotten really way out in front. And, you know, I know there's a whole coalition there and some other labor unions, but I'm worried about it. Um, and then the last thing I want to say, and it's about Amazon, but also about gig work, is that the terms and conditions for how we work is transforming in front of us. And if we don't fight back at Amazon or at Uber or at uh, Grubhub, in 10 to 20 years, that's going to be the expectation for all the students in this class of how work is, right? And so if we don't start to fight back on that front and say, no, these part-time gig jobs where I'm paid for 20 minutes to drop off a, a curry to someone's house and get five bucks, that doesn't work. And if that's how we proceed and we don't take those fights about the future of work and workers forward, we're going to be really screwed in the future. And so that's partly Amazon. Amazon also has gig workers, you know, the people who are dropping our packages are gig workers. Um, and so I think that that also ideologically around how work is organized is a critical fight in front of us. Thank you so much, Todd. Um, and we kind of, you maybe didn't realize this, but you were sort of doing your final thoughts in that answer because we're one at a time. Um, <laughs> so I wanna, um, I want to thank our speakers. This has been, I think, a fabulous discussion, and it's really laying some great groundwork for us. Um, Peter, thank you. Margaret, Todd, um, some robust discussion, as I knew would happen. Um, and we're going to move in to talk next week. And I, you know, I welcome, you know, Todd, Peter, and Margaret. You're all doing plenty, but if you want to maybe spread the word, we encourage you. This is a community classroom. We really believe that. We want to build it. It's a lot easier to build it when we're in the General Baker Institute's home and we got food and we break bread together and that's what we typically do but for now we're going to be back on zoom next week and we're going to be doing uaw and beyond the auto worker so really thinking more broadly and expansively about the uaw and social movement unionism and then when we move into march and we're back in person and it may be a little bit of a commute for margaret um, and perhaps todd also to meet, meet with us in uh, in detroit but when we move into march we're going to be looking at retail workers, service, public sector workers. We're going to talk more about logistics and globalization. And we're really going to dig deeper into different sectors, but always keeping in mind, as Margaret did so wonderfully tonight, that we're not just talking, of course, only about unionized workers in the formal sector, but about work more broadly. So this has been fabulous. Um, thank you again, Todd, Peter, and Margaret. Um, I hope Can our students- Can we send a book list? I oh, got, please. I have books Absolutely. for the students. Yeah. Please do. <laughs> give us your book references now. Give them, give them to us later. Um, but again, you're seeing some love in the chat. I hope you see that. Our students are really good at um, throwing kudos at y'all. Um, and so um, I just want to thank you again. And um, I hope that we can all stay in touch. And I, uh, I've learned a lot tonight. And I'm humbled by the incredible amounts of work all three of you are putting into, into your lives and have for so long. So, um, so thank you. Thank you. Um, whatever coast you're on, um, if you're on the <laughs> third coast, Midwest, like me. Um, but have a great evening, everybody. And um, we will see folks uh, next week. Take care. Right. Thank you. Thank you.